All right, welcome back. So, <clears throat> wanted to talk about Git and uh, provide a little reference for using Git as well as sort of a tutorial on some of the things that I've discovered that I think are useful or cool about Git. So, <clears throat> these notes are available on my GitHub uh, under ccwadi slash git notes. You can also clone them if you have git installed already. And the book that I learned almost everything that I know about git from is available for download at this link. So <clears throat> let's just jump right in. Uh, if you've got Git installed already, which I'm going to assume you've got Git installed, it's pretty easy <clears throat> to start using Git. You just run git init in some directory that you want to track the files that are going to be underneath that directory. <clears throat> and you can also just create that directory with git init followed by the directory. And you can do this in either an empty direct, the first one in either an empty directory or one that already has source code or documents, really whatever in it. So the other way that you start using git is with git clone. This is all probably pretty obvious. If you've <clears throat> used Git at all before, copies the source code for a project as well as its history into the new directory last path if you are cloning from something like this. So <clears throat> that's pretty useful. You can also specify what the directory you want it to be cloned into is if you just tack on that directory at the end. <clears throat> I think that there is almost always a dot git at the very end. I think it's just the repository itself doesn't end in dot git. So that's it for that. And then once you've, you know, got git installed. You probably know that you should run git config global for your username and your email. And then also <clears throat> it's helpful to run your, to set up what your core editor is. Uh, for example, if I do a cat of my global git config, you can see that I have, <clears throat> it's essentially Emacs, but if for some reason Emacs is closed, it'll use the OpenBSD editor MG, which is similar to Emacs. So <clears throat> that's it for that. The basic git commands. <clears throat> so the basic workflow is you modify files, you save them, you git add those files <clears throat> to the index and then you run git commit. So <clears throat> if I, right now I am in a git controlled directory, I can run git status to see that I've modified a file. I've already modified this git.org file and saved it a little bit. So I can do git add git.org and then if I run git status again um, it'll show me what's in the index or the staging area is that's different right so <clears throat> conceptually git keeps track of three trees at any given moment right there's your most recent commit on the current branch that you're on, right? And then there's the index, which is what's going to be committed to that branch next. And there's 
the working tree, which is what's physically on your disk that Git is keeping track of. So <clears throat> right now, my working tree and my index are the same, but my last commit is different. So if I run git commit, that'll pull up my favorite editor of choice. And uh, I'll just say, I think I added some links. Added some links at the beginning of this document. So git add, uh, <clears throat> you can use that to tell git to track, start tracking the file name or to add the changes in file name to the next commit, either way. And <clears throat> if you modify the, modify the file again afterward, you'll have to add it again to get the, chain, the new changes to the next commit. So it only puts the file in its current state into the next commit. And then uh, the staging area or index, I've talked about the set of changed files that will be added to your next commit, as well as all unchanged files from the last commit is called the index or staging area. And then you can run git commit to save a snapshot of everything in the index. If you find adding files to the index to be a pain, you can just modify all the files that you want and then run git commit a and every modified file that you're currently tracking will go into the index and it'll commit it all in one command. So <clears throat> that only deals with files that are already being tracked though, so you don't have to really worry about that too much. And then git status tells you what you're not tracking in the current working directory that you haven't told git to ignore. It tells you what's been new files that have been added to the index. It tells you files that you've moved or renamed in, in the index. It tells you <clears throat> all sorts of goodies. It tells you what branch you're on as well. And then uh, you can create a file called .git ignore with essentially the names of files that you don't want get to mention are untracked, they'll still be untracked, but git won't say like, hey, you're not tracking these files every time you run git status. You can also run git config status dot show untracked files no to have git ignore, just automatically ignore all files that are not already tracked. So that's kind of useful in some situations where you're only really focused on tracking a couple of files in a large directory. Okay. And yeah, you should really only run that uh, for the locally. Okay. So the last couple extra commands are if you want to remove a file from the working directory and from being tracked by git in the future, past commits will still have it. So you're not going to lose that file entirely. It's just no longer a part of your project or whatever. Then you just run git rm file name. If you want to leave it in your working directory, but just stop tracking it, you can do git rm dash dash cached file name. So that's kind of kind of useful to know. You could then add it to your .git ignore. You could use that if you forget to add something to your .git ignore file and you add it accidentally or whatever. And then you can change the name of a file that <coughs> Git already knows about <coughs> and in a way that Git will understand. Just run git move and then the old name and then the new name and then just run commit to save all of those changes in a snapshot. Okay, and then uh, the last thing is as a convenience, you can create aliases. So <clears throat> you run, basically if you want them to be for everything on your current machine, you pass the dash dash global flag.
like this, and then do alias and then the short name of the alias and then your alias definition. You might need to put that alias definition in quotes. I can't remember, honestly, it's been a long time since I've made an alias that had multiple definitions, but if you're curious, if, you, if you're not sure, you can just uh, edit your .git config directly, right? So I have, this one is my go-to git log command, which I'll talk about later. Uh, most of these are just one word though. So <clears throat> anyway, let's move on to git branching. So <clears throat> branching is essentially a way to create a separate path of development on your for an idea on your project or yeah really uh, anything that you want to test out but you don't you want to leave a version um, an original version intact you can use git branching so <clears throat> um, I don't know there shouldn't be a new line there so <clears throat> or an empty line there but you can create a branch based off the current branch head, right? Whatever branch you're currently on with git branch and then whatever new branch name you wanna do. So if we look here, uh, you can see this is one of the aliases that I have set up, but everything that's in this sort of bright green is the name of a branch. And there's actually an orphaned branch down here, but you can kind of ignore that. And this head says what branch we're currently on. But you can see over here, the way that this sort of logging works is that the star tells you what this commit, uh, what branch it's on. So as you can see here, this one that's got the conflict branch is with this branch that came over here and then this one was on the main branch and then they were merged together. So a branch is just a pointer to a particular commit and you can see the start of the commit hash right here. So everything in git or every commit has a hash that is associated with it that uniquely identifies it. And Essentially, when you uh, run git commit, it creates a pointer in your new commit to the last commit and then updates your branch head to point to that latest commit. So <clears throat> that's essentially talking about what I was going to talk about right here. <clears throat> You can also create a new branch and switch to it immediately with git checkout dash b new branch or git switch dash c new branch. You can list all of your branches with git branch. You can also <clears throat> create a branch starting at an arbitrary commit with git branch and then the commit hash. Sorry, you need to say git branch, new branch name, and then the commit hash. And you can just put the start of the commit hash because these are actually like something like 40 characters long or something. You can just put the first four characters and if that's unique, that will work. You, git only needs to see four as a minimum to at least try. Sometimes you'll have a collision with the first four characters, but unless you're working on a really big project, you probably won't. So <clears throat> anyway, um, and then switch to an, an already existing branch with git checkout branch or git switch branch, and then you can switch to the last branch you were on with git switch and then just a dash. So <clears throat> The next thing is if you're done testing some idea, right? So 
the canonical example is <clears throat> you're working on uh, the main line of development for some branch and <clears throat> you want to test out an idea so you create a new branch and uh, you make some commits on that branch and then in the meantime some like you know branch some hot fix or some crucial code needs to be fixed on the main line of development so you save your work on your testing branch you switch to the mainline branch and then you make some commits and then <clears throat> you go back to your testing branch you finish it you make sure it looks good and then what you do is you check out the branch that you want to merge into right so uh, traditionally right what I would have done here is I would have checked out master and master and then right the way that this happened was I did just get merge conflict right so I intentionally created a conflict for the merge which if that happens right if you have changed things in the current branch that were also changed in the other branch you'll get a merge conflict and Git will tell you about this and basically it will annotate the file with these sort of seven <coughs> less thans seven equals and seven greater thans showing you what was conflicting between the two merges and uh, you just go in you manually pick what you want to keep and what you want to discard and then <clears throat> you add that file to the index to tell git that you're done with the conflict uh, you don't even necessarily always have to do that I've had it in situations where it just automatically was added to the index after I fixed it and then you commit and then that's your merge commit so the difference between uh, being on like master and merging the conflict branch like I did here and being on the conflict branch and merging master is that the one that you are on gets moved forward the one that you merge in stays with the same commit right so right after I did this, master was at this F167A0B commit. So <clears throat> that's that, really. Um, the next thing to note is that Git won't let you switch branches if you've changed anything on that branch since your last commit. And uh, you could very easily just do a quick commit to have your you know all your work saved but if you don't want to do that you can just run git stash and this will save all of your changes to the index and the working tree on the current branch and restore both to match the last commit and then you can switch to any branch you want do whatever work you need to do commit and then you can switch back to that branch and then run git stash pop to get your work back to where it was. Now, this is there's a little bit going on with this. And I'll just say you can have multiple stashes. So if you do run git stash list, that'll show all the stashes you have. Git stash is actually a shorthand for git stash push which puts a new stash at the beginning of the stash list gets git stash pop applies the first stash to the current branch and removes it from the list but you can apply stashes to branches that are different from the ones they were created from or out of order with the like list by just doing git stash apply and then the number in that list so let me just uh, everything's clean here but if I do <clears throat> let's do a let's do an echo hello to f file and now you can see I've got this 
I can run git stash. So git, I have uh, aliased, right? So I have these aliases, uh, st is status, and then gsh is git stash, right? So now if I run git status, yeah, I'm back to where I was, right? And if I do git stash list, you can see this list and you can just use those numbers, right? Git stash at zero. <clears throat> you can just use those numbers in place of various, <clears throat> um, instead of, yeah, you can just use those numbers to pick out certain stashes in that list. And <clears throat> you can also see the diff. So, If I do git stash show zero, you can see that all this stash did was add a line hello to f file. And if you want, if you decide you don't want to apply that stash, you can just run, right? So I could apply it with either git stash pop. I could also do git stash apply zero. But if I want to drop it without applying it, if you run apply, you'll need to drop it later unless you want to keep it around. I'm just going to run git stash drop zero. And now if I do git stash list, it'll bring up nothing, right? And <clears throat> the uh, I should mention that the default for git stash show doesn't actually show you the diff, it just shows you statistics about the diff. But if you set this git config dash dash global stash dot show patch yes, it'll give you the actual diff. And the last thing that I'll say, which will make more sense when I talk about recovery, is that stashes, after they've been dropped or popped, create dangling commit objects, right? So if I run git fs check, to see if I have any dangling commits. So these are commits that are not at the head of a branch or reachable in the ancestry of the <clears throat> any of your branches, right? <clears throat> so what I can do is I can do git prune and uh, git garbage collect usually will work but sometimes you have to run git prune. And now if I do a git fs check, I don't have any dangling commits. So <clears throat> that's just something to keep in mind, right? And <clears throat> you'll want to make sure before you run git prune that all of the commits that are dangling are ones that are actually just stashes and not ones that you actually want to save that you for like forgot to have a reference to but we'll cover we'll talk about that more in recovery <clears throat> and uh, as part of that recovery talk we'll also talk about the ref log so <clears throat> this shows the history of what commits you had checked out so if I do get ref log ooh, Uh, you can see it says like <clears throat> everything that I have had my head branch at. So you can see reset moving to head, checkout moving from such and such to master, checkout moving from this branch to <clears throat> something I can't see because my face is in the way, to FEC4 moving from all of this to 4B, 4F, right? And I'm just using the first four characters of the hash because I don't want to say the whole thing. But you can see I'm just essentially checking out commits that aren't associated with any branch. They're in the history of those branches, branch heads, I should really say. But <clears throat> yeah, that's just uh, something to be aware of, really. So, <clears throat> And we'll talk more about that when we get into recovery. So this is the most like interesting or the stuff that I feel like you really wanna know 
but that can be kind of hard if you're just reading documentation to figure out. <clears throat> so to view the project history, you generally want to use git log. And uh, as I've shown you, my most used incantation of git log is git log dash dash one line dash dash decorate dash dash graph dash dash all. So this shows every commit visible from every branch in an abbreviated format. So that's what the one line does. The all is every commit visible from every branch. The graph is the nice little ASCII graph that shows you where things diverged and merged. And the decorate shows you where branch heads are. So if we look at this, you can see it's a pretty short commit history, but it's, you know, representative of, you know, a lot of different branches. You can see that I've got a conflict branch that is pointing to this commit. I've got a fake file branch that's pointing here. My master branch is pointing to this branch and I've also checked out master. So, and then it's got the shortened version of the commit hash and the first line of the commit message. So that's pretty convenient. If you want to see the full diff of what was introduced in a commit, you can do git show commit or git log dash p. The dash p will show you the patch file or the diff of that commit and then dash one to only show you the history of like one commit. So just that commit. If you wanted to see multiple commits in the history, just put dash two or dash three. Similarly, if I do glt dash five, it'll only show me five commits <clears throat> total. So that's kind of interesting. I can do git show and then I'll do f167, right? So you can see <clears throat> This is a merge and it's telling me what was merged in from each branch. So we actually <clears throat> had a conflict there and we had lines added from both branches. So <clears throat> that's what's going on there. Okay, <clears throat> a couple extra useful things is you can show only those commits that introduce or change a particular string by running git log dash s string. So that's colloquially referred to as the pickaxe option for git. And <clears throat> you can use that to see which commits have changed a certain variable. And <clears throat> you can show commits that were made to a function using this sort of magic incantation, right? Wherever the function name is and the file name that it's in with the dash l option. So that's pretty useful. <clears throat> Git grep, <clears throat> I don't really use that this often, but I would imagine that if I were working on a much bigger project, I would. <clears throat> you can search for strings in tracked files in the working tree with just git grep string. You can search the index instead by doing git grep dash dash cached string. And then string is actually a basic regular expression by default. You can use fixed strings with dash F. That's a little bit faster that way. Extended regular expressions with dash E and Perl regular expressions with, that, with dash P. <clears throat> you can see the function that a pattern is contained in using git grep dash P search string. So that's pretty similar to that dash L option that <clears throat> we talked about before, but it's just giving you a different version of context. And then you can also search in a different commit by appending its hash. So <clears throat> to only search within files matching a shell wildcard, append them to everything else with dash dash file names at the end. So those are two separate things, right? We've got the commits that you want to search for and then the files that you want to search for. So as an example, you could do git grep dash p quirky variable 
some commit hash. You could also, if it's at the branch head, you could use the branch name and then a dash dash and then files ending in star.c. This searches for every instance of quirky var showing us the function it's in to in the commit with hash beginning with ffa37e in files ending in .c. So the single quotes in the original command are just there to show you that git's version of grep can handle the wild cards. If you don't put those single quotes there, it would the shell would expand it. So maybe you've got some .c files in that <coughs> commit that aren't currently in your working directory. So in that case, you would want to put the star or the quotations around the star .c and have git grep expand it instead of your shell. And then git diff I use all the time to view the difference between your working tree and the staging area slash index, you just run git diff. To view the difference between the working tree and an arbitrary commit, you can use git diff commit and you can just use head to view the difference between your working tree and the last commit of the branch you're currently on. And to view the difference between the staging area and a commit, you use git diff dash dash cached and then the commit. If you leave out commit, it'll just use head, the current branch you're on. And you can compare the difference between arbitrary commits using git diff commit one and commit two. There's more options to that, but I don't really use them. So let's look at remotes. <clears throat> So if you just wanna look at other people's source code, you're not gonna be saving your source code anywhere. You can ignore this section, but otherwise you'll presumably have a GitHub account, which you'll wanna to push to, but GitHub doesn't really allow you to just enter your GitHub password to do this anymore. So I use SSH keys, and in the way that you set this up is you do an ls-al for squiggly or tilde slash dot ssh. And if you see, it can really just be any file ending in dot pub, then you can skip this next step. You've already got a public private ssh key pair. Otherwise, in git bash, you can just run ssh keygen dash t and then this key type. You don't have to add the dash t option. I just like that key style because it's the mo or public private key pair or that key generation algorithm because it's the most modern. <clears throat> and uh, if you hit enter for the defaults, it'll just do it without a password. But I do recommend giving it a password because then it's encrypted both, the private key will be encrypted with that password on your local machine. <clears throat> and uh, then you just go to GitHub and add your, the public version of the key under settings, SSH and GPG keys, and uh, you give it a title and you put the pub, dot pub key in the little spot where it tells you to put the key and then click add new SSH key. And there's more you can do here, specifically uh, starting SSH agent. OpenBSD starts that for you by default. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I'm not really gonna go into that, but essentially you can just have, <clears throat> you can just run eval and then backtick SSS agent backtick when you start and then it will only ask you for your password one time. <clears throat> so there's also documentation on that. So if we go to, I'll just let that load in the background and I'll try and come, that, come back to that. But there's documentation on how to start SSH agent. So <clears throat> as well as that whole thing. So let's let that load. <clears throat> and then uh, the basic idea with remotes is you can show them with git remote or git remote dash V. 
and you can add a remote to your project with git remote add and then the short name that you want to refer to that remote by and then the URL. So if you create a new repository on GitHub that you're going to store a code base you've already got on your local machine with, it'll say like, hey, run this git remote add origin and then the URL uh, in your uh, project directory. So <clears throat> once you've done that, it should automatically allow you to run git fetch short name to pull in all of the history from that remote project. <clears throat> so that gives you like an origin slash branch name for all of the branches that are on the remote, right? And you can merge those into local branches that you have. They don't create local versions of those branches for you automatically. You'll have to do that yourself. But <clears throat> that's, uh, it's basically after you've run git fetch, it's just normal merging. So <clears throat> the one thing that I'll note that sometimes I've had to do this manually is add these or add this fetch line to the dot git config dot git slash config file to get this to work. <clears throat> it should do it automatically when you run remote add, but I found that on when I'm have some like bare initialized repositories, which I haven't added, but which is how I manage my dot files. It doesn't do that necessarily. So, <clears throat> and the URL will be something like this if you're using HTTPS instead of SSH. There are ways that you can do authentication with HTTPS, but I find it to be more complicated than just using SSH. So <clears throat> that's pulling in stuff from the remote to your machine. When you wanna update the remote, with stuff that's on your machine, you uh, run git push, you know, you check out the branch that you want to push and you run git push short name of the remote and then the branch. And if you haven't merged in the most recent stuff from the remote, this will fail. <clears throat> but yeah, that's basically it. And you can uh, rename a remote with git remote rename and then old name, new name, and uh, you can remove a remote with git remote rm and then the short name. So <clears throat> that's the basic stuff. And then just sort of an example of how this might work is suppose you've got a remote called origin that you've cloned from or otherwise added. And if you're on your master branch in your local repository and you run git fetch origin, this will update the origin slash master branch to reflect what it is on the server. And so then you can run git merge with your master branch checked out. You can run git merge origin slash master to merge in those changes. If someone else pushes to the origins master branch in the meantime, the server's master branch will be updated, but your origin master branch will not be updated until you run git fetch again. And then after merging origin slash master, if necessary, you can run git push origin master to update any changes you have made to the server. And then you should also note that any branches you create locally will not automatically be uploaded to the server. So you can have your own private branches that you don't share with anyone. You have to explicitly push a branch to a remote for that remote to get it. And then if someone else pushes a branch that you don't have yet, you don't automatically get a local version of it. You can run git checkout dash B new branch origin new branch to get one that also tracks the remote one by default. And what that means is that git status will tell you when you are on that branch. So when I type DG, that's basically an alias for git for my dot files. You can see that it says my branch is up to date with origin master. So because that master branch is tracking the remote origin branch. And it also means that if I run git pull, just git pull, no like, or just git fetch or just git push. Um, well, just git push and git pull, I think. 
then it will autom when I'm on the master branch, it automatically knows to pull from the origin master branch to fetch that down and merge it in. That's what pull does. It fetches and merges all in one go and get push knows to push the current branch to the origin remote. So <clears throat> if you have a local branch that you already, uh, already set up that you wanna set to track a remote branch, you just do get branch dash U and then the remote branch name <clears throat> with that branch checked out. Okay, and then this is you know, it's version control, so you should be able to switch to different versions. And just as a side note, everything that I've talked about so far does not delete any history except the git prune and git garbage collection stuff that I was talking about with git stash. <clears throat> so <clears throat> you can't really lose any data with anything that I've talked about so far except git prune and git garbage git gc which is not an alias by the way that's just the name of the command it's just gc <clears throat> if you run those commands <clears throat> you will <clears throat> um you everything else you can't really lose anything but sometimes you do something wrong and you want to move like your master branch head back to a previous commit, right? <clears throat> so say you want your master to point to the commit B03E dot 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 whatever, and that's just an example. <clears throat> uh, first four letters slash digits of a hash. If that's all you want, right? So <clears throat> remember the master is just a label pointing to a commit, right? Then you can just run git reset uh, dash dash soft and then however much of the hash you need to get it to point to that. <clears throat> Your index will still remain what it was before you did that, right? <clears throat> Which if your working directory was clean, that'll be the same as the last commit you did on master. Otherwise, it's the last commit you did on master plus whatever you've added. If you want the index to match the commit you're switching to, then you just run git reset without the dash dash soft, right? So <clears throat> this command, right? Forget the dash dash soft. And if you want to make the working directory match the commit as well, then you do pass dash dash hard, right? So <clears throat> you shouldn't run dash dash hard without a clean working directory because then you'll lose any of the modifications you've made to your working directory. So you should either just make a commit to say like, hey, here's a commit, like this is, and just put in the commit message, like just committing so that I don't lose any work here before resetting master. <clears throat> and uh, then do the reset. You should also, before you do the reset, <clears throat> do something like get branch master, or get branch old master, so that you have a reference to that commit before you move master to that other commit. So I'll show you what I'm talking about, right? So let's do an L tree here. <clears throat> and <clears throat> just as an example, um, I'll switch, um, I'll do a git branch old master, right? And now you can see that I've got this new old master branch pointing right here. And my git status, nothing to commit, working tree clean. And now I can do a reset dash dash hard to, let's just, um, just to make it easy, we'll change this master branch to point to this conflict commit. 
Okay, so now if we do an LT, you can see now master is at this commit, right? So I've changed some of this stuff. And <clears throat> if that's the point at which you are like, okay, we know the source code was good there, then you can start just doing your add and commit to the master branch and that old master will be around so you can figure out what went wrong later and then <clears throat> you can put those changes in master when you're ready. So <clears throat> to get back to that, I'll do do this and now you can see that the tree is back to where it was before and I'll delete old master. So now I don't have any extra branches lying around as well. Okay. Um, and then just as a side note, um, Let's just do a search for SSH. Yeah, so this whole section, uh, connect with SSH, tells you <clears throat> how to generate an SSH key as well as adding your SSH key to the SSH agent. <clears throat> so yeah, that's uh, it's pretty much just that. And then you have to add it and then when you add it, it will create the file that you want it to create, uh, or it'll not ask, it'll ask you for your password once and then it won't ask you again. So <clears throat> that's what the, I was talking about before. <clears throat> and uh, what else do we have for recovery? Um, if you forget to do that, you know, set the branch to where you wanted. So <clears throat> let's do this. Now if I do my LT, I've lost a couple of commits, right? They're no longer shown because they're just dangling. And you can verify that with <clears throat> git fs check um well you can check the ref log to see <clears throat> that reset moving to old master and moving to conflict so this is where the old master was right so if i copy that now I can do reset hard to there. And now if I do a git list tree, we're back to where we were. So <clears throat> I don't know why git fs check didn't find that dangling commit right there. Maybe it's because it <clears throat> still thinks that old master was around. But in any case, you can use <clears throat> git ref log to see what commits you were on before you reset. <clears throat> and uh, that only keeps stuff around for so long though. So if you need to find commits that aren't reachable from a branch, you can run git fs check dash dash full and that will pull up dangling commits if you have any. So <clears throat> that's basically it, right? Um, I didn't really go into stuff to make you look smarter or to rewrite the history of your Git project, right? To rewrite your commit history. But this is mostly what you need to get started using Git and GitHub to save your work <clears throat> and create branches and really like probably 99% of what you need to use Git for. Uh, Check that book out if you want more information. There's a lot of good stuff in there, but this will get you started and should take you very far and should cover almost all of the use cases you need Git for. So thanks for watching. Click like if you like this video. Click subscribe if you really liked it. 
uh, hit dislike if you didn't like it leave a comment down below letting me know why in either case as well as if you got any questions criticisms concerns and <clears throat> uh, if you want to get notified when I make new videos hit subscribe thanks peace